Back in January 2010, I was a student at the University of California, Irvine, and I received an email from the School of Social Sciences, which I'm a part of, uh, that was saying that His Excellency Michael B. Oren would be coming to our campus, and he was an Israeli ambassador to the United States at the time, and he still is right now. He would be coming to our campus in order to give a lecture on the historical relationship between Israel and the United States. And really, the event was being put on by the university along with uh, other campus organizations and off-campus organizations, pro-Israeli, pro-Zionist organizations, um, both on and off campus. And the school was not making any mention of the plight of the Palestinian people. And the event was coming almost exactly on the one-year anniversary of Operation Cast Lead, which was the operation in the Gaza Strip um, by the Israeli military that led to the death of over 1,400 Palestinians. Uh, no mention was ever made of the Palestinian people that had been killed. No mention was ever made of the occupation. Instead, the university was rolling out a red carpet for Michael Oren. And for us, that amounted to nothing less than tacit approval of Israeli policies in regards to the way in which the Israeli government deals with the Palestinian people. And so, us being students, of course, we weren't too happy with that. Um, and what do students do when they're not happy? They like to protest. And so we got together and we decided to protest his presence on campus. And for some of the students, it was also a personal matter. Uh, actually, two of the eventual Irvine 11 had family members. Some of their cousins were killed during Operation Cast Lead. Uh, their families were originally from the Gaza Strip. Uh, and for them, it was, you know, their cousins had been in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so it was, it was a personal matter that this man was responsible for the death of their family members. And we were fully aware of the role that Michael Oren had played during Operation Cast Lead, both as the, uh, as the spokesperson for the Israeli military, and even before that he had served in the Israeli uh, Defense Forces as a paratrooper in, the, in the, uh, the invasion of Lebanon in the 1980s that led to the death of, of over 30,000 Lebanese civilians. So we were well aware of the role Michael Oren had played and his direct responsibility in Operation Cast Lead, as well as in other uh, uh, invasions and occupations that had taken place. For me, I'm not Palestinian, but I also had the opportunity to visit the Gaza Strip a few months after the ending of Operation Cast Lead. And for me, what I had seen had left a very, very clear message in my mind. Um, and it showed me that really, when the Israeli soldiers came into Gaza, they came in and really played, you know, modern warfare Call of Duty with people's lives. Uh, and that there was just, everywhere you went, there was just bullet holes everywhere. Everything was destroyed. It had been months since the uh, since Operation Cast Lead had ended, yet there was still no ability to even rebuild. Uh, and we even got a chance to speak to uh, these three young girls, known as the Samuni girls. And at one point in time, they were giving us their story. And in, during the course of their story, one of the girls, and she's the oldest one of the three girls, they're all cousins, uh, she begins to tell her story, and it's never really out of pity either. It's just more so in order for her to get across the point of what she's dealt with. And when you ask them, oh, how can we help? Their only thing is, you know, just let people in America know what's really happening. So here's my story for you to relate to others in America. And so she's giving us her story, and at the end she asks the question of, what did I do to Israel for them to have done this to my family? What have I done to Israel for them to take away my family like this? And she had lost 40 members of her family. And she had lost her entire immediate family um, in one bombing. And so to hear her ask this question of what did I do to deserve this, it sticks with you. And so when Michael Oren was coming to camp, it was, it was never a matter of should we do something, but what is it that we should do? We sat down and we actually went through a long laundry list of ideas in regards to how we wanted to protest. We actually settled on something that we called the University of Chicago style protest. And the reason why we called it that was because I believe in October of the previous year, I think it was October or November, I can't remember exactly when, uh, Ehud Olmer, who, was also, who had been an Israeli official, was giving a talk at the University of Chicago, and around 30 students, and even I believe a professor, had stood up individually, one by one, and individually disrupted his lecture. Uh, and they would stand up, they would yell out either a statement, some even read off a, a list of the names of people who had been killed during Operation Cast Lead, and they would keep going. Sometimes they would go 30 seconds, sometimes they would go a minute, sometimes even longer, and the police would come, and they would escort them out, and then that was the end of the story. No one was academically disciplined, nobody was arrested. So for us also, this was just one example of, you know what, this is one way to protest, um, and this is something that we liked that we had seen in another protest. Even on our own campus at UC Irvine, 
In November of the previous year, the UC Regents, which is the governing body of the entire University of California system, was deciding on uh, tuition fee hike increases, which left students really, really mad and angry. Uh, and even at UC Irvine, we had a huge protest um, that November. Uh, and during the protest, actually we had probably over a thousand students protesting. We actually go to every major lecture hall on campus and we disrupt it completely. Um, and at times the professors would concede and they'd be like, all right, class is dismissed, everybody can leave. And at other times the professors wouldn't be too happy with the fact that their lecture was being disrupted. And even at one point in time, one student gets up on the stage and he yells out, you know what, class is dismissed, everybody leave. Um, and the professor is not too happy with that and they actually get into a, a little bit of an argument which turns into a shoving match until it's eventually broken up. Um, and the reason why I mention all of this is you're having hundreds of students coming into a lecture hall, walking up and down the aisles from every possible door with another thousand students outside. Everybody's chanting, walk out, walk out, walk out. And then you have a student that gets even into a shoving match. And all this time, the UC Irvine Police Department, along with uh, the senior university, uh, UC Irvine, uh, administrators who are in charge of student conduct on campus are all present at the protest and are all following along with the protest. Nobody's academically disciplined, nobody's arrested for any of these disruptions. So for us this was also, this is something that happened on our own campus. Not only did this happen at the University of Chicago or did Code Pink do this or did any one of these numerous groups that protest in these ways do this on somewhere else in the United States, but this is on our own campus, students have protested in this manner. And so we thought, you know what, this is more than within our legal rights to do something like this. And so we took the University of Chicago style disruption and we decided to manipulate it a little bit in order to fit our own circumstances. We decided in the end that we would have 10 students who would disrupt individually, um, and there would be other students in the audience and they would come and support the students who were disrupting. And after the 10th student disrupted, uh, a large student walkout would take place. And so we went in with this mindset. And so sometimes people have asked us, well, why did you guys protest in this way? And really the main reason was to send a message to Michael Oren that would be relayed directly back to Tel Aviv. We didn't feel that asking questions and answers would get that message across. Um, and that we went into this protest with a purpose and a goal in mind. And our goal wasn't to educate the audience. Because sometimes when you have a protest, you have, you know, you have a, a goal in mind. Sometimes it's to educate the audience. Sometimes it's to send a message, whatever it may be. This time it was to send a message directly to Michael Oren, the speaker himself, and to the Israeli government. We understood that we were dealing with a state power, that Michael Oren represents state power, and that in the course of his event, and really state powers, what they like to do is to legitimize and enhance their power by allowing for certain forms of dissent. And so in the course of this lecture, Michael Oren would be allowing um, and really enhancing his power by allowing for you to you know, up challenge him by asking some tough questions. Now for us really to challenge Michael Oren in the way he wants to be challenged is not a challenge. And so we wanted to go outside of that framework that the event provided. And for us, that was by throwing a curveball at Michael Oren and using the element of surprise that we had as audience members by popping up randomly throughout the lecture hall and yelling out a short statement. And that if we had said those statements during a question and answer session, they wouldn't have been as amplified as it is during the middle of the lecture when you know, everyone's listening and then all of a sudden a voice appears and it kind of just shuts the room down in terms of silence. And so that was really the, the mindset that we had going into the event. The event took place on a Monday night, February 8th, 2010. The lecture hall was a, a room in the student center that's able to hold up to 700 people and it was packed. They even had an overflow room with a few other hundred people I think in the overflow room. So the event was packed and we knew also that it would be packed with community members, not necessarily students, that this event was more for the community. He starts talking in about 30 seconds or a minute into his talk. I'm actually the first student to stand up. Michael Oren, propagating murder is not an expression of free speech. Shut up. The audience immediately reacted. And actually, my statement was a little bit longer. Michael Oren propagating murder is not an expression of free speech. The only stand you deserve to take is in front of the International Criminal Court. 
Um, I didn't get off the second half of it um, because what we had also decided was is that once the crowd reacts to the disruption, you don't actually want to raise your voice above the level of the crowd and just make it look like you're just screaming angrily um, and just shouting your head off without anyone really be, being able to hear you. So once the crowd's voice erupted and it was, a, it was a mix of cheers and booing, someone yelled at me. I didn't hear this, but someone told me, and I think it was even caught on video, um, someone told me I, should, I would be better off becoming a suicide bomber. Um, so there was a lot of opposition and also a lot of support of people. So I began making my way to the aisle and the police meet me at the aisle. Um, and they actually grab me and they take me to a back room and I'm patted down and I'm arrested uh, immediately in handcuffs. And they had come prepared. I mean, there was literally a mound of metal handcuffs just waiting in that back room. And what's ironic is at that time, the MC of the event, who was the chair of the political science department, which was also sponsoring uh, the event, Professor Mike Petraka, had gotten up on the microphone. He's like, one interruption is fine, get it out of your system. I was already <laughs> in handcuffs, um, unable to, to do anything. Uh, so it was obvious that one interruption was not fine and the university was not going to tolerate any form of disruption. The event continues and then a second student interrupts and he yells out his statement. And at this point in time, I can't even hear anything. All I hear is just, you know, an increase in the volume of the room and then it kind of decreases again and another student walks into the back. Uh, where I am is handcuffed and arrested and put down on the ground next to me. Um, and so the, the second student goes and then the event proceeds and then a the third student. And there was maybe about 30 seconds to a minute in between each student and then finally the fourth student goes. And each student was yelling out a different statement. One student yelled out, uh, Judaism is free of the crimes of, of Zionism. Uh, another student yelled out, it is a shame that this university has sponsored a mass murderer like yourself. Another student yelled out, uh, you sir are an accomplice to genocide. Some of the students actually repeated my statement. Um, I guess in the heat of the moment they forgot what, they, what, what was on their card uh, and they just yelled out anything. Uh, and so the students would join me in the back and after the fourth student actually, Michael Warren decided to take a break from the event um, and he goes off the stage for about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, and afterwards the event continues. Now, once the event continues, the protest continues and student number five goes and student number six and then student number seven and then number eight and then number nine and then finally number 10. Um, and each student is just one by one by one um, with maybe you know 30 seconds to a minute um, in between each one. And each one of our statements takes about 10 or 12 seconds max. Uh, and so finally after the 10th student, a loud student walkout occurs. And during the process of the loud student walkout, some of the students are chanting and one of the students is actually grabbed by police um, and is also arrested. Um, and he joins us in the back and that's how we become 11. The event continues after that. Uh, and actually, in terms of our planning, we had planned to end our protest and have the student walk out at around 6.25. Um, and we ended up actually walking out at 6.27. So we were running two minutes, be, uh, you know, past the actual timing that we had. The event itself was supposed to continue until seven o'clock. And so we left ample amount of time for Michael Oren to finish his speech. And he ended up having about 35 minutes left to finish his speech anyways. And Michael Oren actually does complete his speech because this has often been the, uh, the argument that's put against us is that, well, you didn't allow Michael Oren to complete his speech when in fact he actually completed his speech and the chancellor of the university himself actually came out the next day and was like, oh, in an attempt to calm the, the uproar that had come about uh, in regards to our protest, I said, well, actually the event was successful and Michael Oren completed his speech. And he completed his speech with about 10 minutes left uh, in the event, after which uh, he had the ability to take question and answers. And so always the counter argument has been when we say, well, actually Michael Oren did finish his speech, is well, you didn't allow the audience to ask question and answers and you took away their right to do so because of the amount of time you took up. Now, Michael Oren was able to field question and answers with about 10 or 15 minutes left before 7 o'clock, but he actually ends the event early and goes off to a Los Angeles Lakers basketball game um, because he has a photo opportunity with Kobe Bryant. We actually had the head of Los Angeles Lakers security testify uh, to this fact during our trial. So in terms of making life miserable for Michael Oren and him not being able to complete his speech, we only took up seven minutes of a scheduled 90-minute talk. Um, and so with that, we are eventually cited uh, uh, and released um, at UC Irvine. 
uh, and were let go a few hours after the event. Uh, and for us, we really thought, okay, yeah, we got arrested, but I mean, really this is more of an intimidation on the part of the university and that UC Irvine police responds to the commands of the administrators. And when, they, when administrators say, hey, we're not gonna tolerate anything today, UC Irvine police respond and they have people arrested as a sign of intimidation not necessarily because they're committing a crime and that yeah you'll get released and you'll or you get you'll get cited released and no one's really ever going to follow up with with what you did um and for sure no judge is going to allow a case like this in front of his courtroom uh and that obviously it's freedom of speech it happens all the time and so we really didn't make much of it at that point in time and instead we were like all right did we accomplish what we came to do yes we did we felt we had sent our message um and that really we had accomplished, it was a mission accomplishment. The next day actually, it begins to pick up in the media, the Orange County Register and other, you know, media organizations from the Orange County area begin to pick up on the story and even some international news. Um, the major Israeli newspaper, Haaretz, picks up on the story as well and it begins to get broadcast around. And we're like, okay, cool, this is actually getting a lot of media coverage. We didn't expect it to get that much media coverage, uh, but it was. And a few days later, we begin to actually receive emails in our inboxes from the university itself saying, hey, we think you guys might have broken some school rules, so we'd like to sit down and meet to discuss this. So at that point in time, we actually begin a seven-month academic disciplinary procedure with the university. The protest took place in February. The discipline and the final uh, sanctions on us were placed uh, on, in late August or early September. Um, so really a seven month period of meetings and, and whatnot with the university. Um, and in the end, each one of us is individually academically disciplined by the university. And the Muslim Student Union, which eight of us were a part of, uh, was also disciplined and held responsible for the, uh, uh, for the protest. And at that point in time, Eight of us were UC Irvine students, three of us were UC Riverside students. So the UC Riverside students were dealing with the Riverside administration and we were dealing with the Irvine administration and we were all academically uh, disciplined. And the Muslim Student Union was actually suspended for a year and then that suspension was reduced to a quarter suspension, which is 10 weeks um, in our academic system. Uh, at which point in time, the, the school year continued and the MSU, you know, they went back to doing what they do. Um, and we thought that that was the end of the road. We felt even that the academic disciplinary sanctions were harsh, um, considering that no one who had protested in this fashion had ever been disciplined um, in this way. But we thought, you know what, okay, we were disciplined by the university, yes, we don't agree, but okay, this has to be the end of the road, we can continue with our lives and everything will just go back to normal. Uh, and actually, what we ended up finding out was that a few weeks later after we received our uh, our punishments was that the Orange County District Attorney had begun to investigate and was actually sending investigators into the field um, in order to inv uh, uh, ask people questions and interrogate people um, and really what became harassment of a lot of students on our campus um, and what he would do would he would show up at someone's house at 5 a.m. on a Sunday morning, banging on the door, hey, this is the police, open up. Um, and they would show up to people's houses day after day after day and really intimidate the parents, too, um, of students at UC Irvine. Uh, I know your son and daughter is in there. Uh, let me talk to them. And the parents would be, no, he's not here. I know they're in here. And it would just happen on a daily basis um, with these students trying to get them to, uh, to answer his questions. Uh, and so this went on for some time. And we actually found out also that the uh, the district attorney had initiated uh, uh, subpoenas and even a grand jury subpoena um, and grand jury testimony everything that he could possibly do to get felony charges against us and he had even enacted search warrants um, and he had obtained almost all of our uh, communications by email from Google, Yahoo, Hotmail, uh, whatever it may be uh, from a period of about two weeks from all these different email providers uh, during the time of the protest and so he actually came upon a hundred thousand uh, pages of documents um, from our from our emails and, and other type of uh, communications and all of this was used to attempt to get felony charges and even everything he had gotten is usually only granted by a judge when you have a felony case on hand it has to be a very serious type of crime um, in order to, to do this and all we had done was protest and I mean if you watch the video it's quite obvious yes that's me um, that's protesting we never attempted to deny that you know that's me protesting but 
really what else is there other than what's on the video? Um, and is that really a felony charge? And he really did everything in his, in his power to try and get felonies. Uh, and even when it came time for the grand jury, uh, he had, what ends up happening is if you have to testify, is you have to have your papers served to you. Um, and so a lot of the students, they had classes and, and, and whatnot. I mean, they had regular lives. And so he went well out of his way in order to have the papers hand delivered to them. Because you can't give it to their parents. You can't give it to their cousin, to their uncle, to their aunt. It has to be given to them for it to be official and for them to have to actually testify in front of the grand jury. And so one girl has her midterm one day and is pulled out of her midterm by a man in a suit. Here you go. Here are your papers. Um, someone else is driving home, goes to fill up gas. All of a sudden, an unmarked Crown Victoria pulls up behind her or him, and here's your papers. Uh, and so that was really what was happening. And so, of course, students were intimidated and, and, and scared by this. And so the grand jury is summoned. And in the end, he actually has one year to file misdemeanor charges. So his statute of limitation is one year for a misdemeanor and three years for a felony. So it comes almost full circle to one full year after the protest had happened, February 8th, 2011. Um, I think at the time it was February 6th or 7th. He ends up filing charges on a misdemeanor. Uh, and I guess he realized that, hey, there's not really much I can get um, in, terms of, in terms of a felony. Uh, and really the only thing that we could have possibly thought of and the lawyers even thought of in terms of a felony was he was looking for something terrorism related. That you know what, these are 11 Muslim students who have acted up um, and he was really trying to find something in, in, in that regard like, oh, this is the next Al-Qaeda sleeper cell or something um, here in UC Irvine. Because there really was nothing else that you could possibly think of in terms of felony charges. Uh, and that he, that's really why he was looking into our communications was to kind of see what was our thinking and, and what was going on. Um, and really when we were just exercising our First Amendment rights. And so we're finally charged with two misdemeanors. The first being uh, disturbance of a public meeting and conspiracy to disturb a public meeting. And this happens right before the one year deadline. And a few weeks later, uh, the district attorney himself uh, Tony Rokakis actually wants to sit down and talk to us and negotiate a settlement. And we find out once we get there that there really isn't much negotiations that's going to take place. We're offered a deal of pleading guilty, um, admitting that we committed a crime and that we would be given community service and a few other things. Um, and really for him it was a way in which to score some cheap political points by saying, hey, I took care of these kids. We felt that what we had done was completely well within our rights and so we didn't take the deal. Um, and even Tony Rakakis himself sat down at the table with us um, and really what was an attempt to really intimidate us. Uh, I mean, this is the district attorney for one of the biggest counties in America. Um, I think it's within like the top 10 biggest counties in America. And he's taking his time out to sit with a bunch of misdemeanors. Um, that doesn't happen. Um, this is a man who's a political uh, official. Um, he's elected. And so for Tony Rakakis, it really was a no brainer. Um, to try and offer us a settlement where he can come out and say, hey, these students said they were guilty, um, and then go about his normal business. The only problem was is that we didn't feel we had done anything wrong. And so we begin to go through the process of going to trial. Um, and before you actually go to trial, you have tons of, of hearings in which pre-trial motions and other things are heard out um, in order to get ready for the actual trial. So during the course of pre-trial pre motions, um, at one point in time we went through something called discovery where each side brings out the evidence that they're going to present during the course of the, uh, of the trial. And so the district attorney at this point in time releases all the information he had obtained from the search warrants and our attorney is going through them, or one of our attorneys is going through them, and realizes that a lot of the documents are actually uh, privileged information because it's communications between her and us. And at the time, she was our attorney, and we were her clients, and that's attorney-client privilege. And so the judge ends up ruling on, on this. We file a motion um, saying that these were all illegally obtained, and the judge ends up siding with us um, and actually strikes out 20,000 documents from the 100,000 documents uh, of, of evidence and saying that they were all attorney-client privilege. And even at that point in time also, the judge remo uh, removed, I believe, three attorneys from the case as well as the lead investigator from the case, which is a huge blunder from the district attorney's office to have that many people removed from the case. 
Now, one of the main pieces of evidence being used to prosecute the 11th student, the guy who was part of the student walkout, is an email between him and, the, and one of the attorneys. And so the judge strikes that out, and the, dist the district attorney no longer has any uh, evidence against this 11th student. And so at that point in time, the district attorney decides to return to the settlement table with the 11th student, offers him a no guilty plea, and he actually takes it. We tell him, you know what, great offer. You plead that you're innocent. That's as if, you know, you never did anything. And you can go about your normal, you know, everyday life. And so he takes the, uh, the no guilty plea and has to do about 40 hours of community service. And at that point in time, we become the 10 students on trial rather than the Irvine 11 being put on trial. And so really for us, we were never offered any such deal. And so that's why we never took anything of that nature. Um, and we wanted to maintain our innocence and that what we had done was you know, well within our rights. And so we go to trial and really most misdemeanors take about two to three days. Ours took about four weeks. Um, and so it really became a nice nine to five job. Um, and at times it was interesting, at times it was quite boring. Um, and, you know, but it was a good experience. You learned a lot from it. Um, and in the end, we were found guilty uh, unanimously by the jury of both of our uh, charges. And during sentencing, the district attorney was trying to get us to serve some form of jail time. Uh, but the judge actually during sentencing said that due to the fact that this was a nonviolent protest and that these students acted out of moral conscience um, and that they really, it was, their actions were a sincere action. They weren't just trying to cause chaos and havoc, um, but they felt that they were coming from a principled moral standpoint um, that he would, and that we had, you know, good community uh, 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 records and we had always had outstanding behavior. This didn't warrant any jail time and that he would just give us community service and probation. Um, and so in the end, we were given community service and probation. Uh, and for us, though, that really wasn't the end of the line because uh, we felt that what we had done was not wrong in any sense of the word. Rude, yeah, but rude is not against the, uh, is not against the law. And that we were, actually, that was the, the point, was to be rude. Um, and that when you're dealing with a form of injustice, I mean, you should be rude towards injustice. Um, and so that we really wanted to cement the fact that people should not be allowed to be prosecuted by a district attorney because their political views go against that of the district attorney um, or of anyone within political power. Uh, and that anyone who wants to protest should be able to protest. And so we decided to appeal the case. Um, and the case is currently going through the appeals process right now, which takes a lot of time. Uh, but we're hopeful that it will be overturned during the appeals process based on the fact that the way in which we were prosecuted uh, was that was selectively and that that to be prosecuted selectively is unconstitutional um, and that that this form of protest is well within the rights of, of everyone here in this country um, and that the best way to protect our rights is to exercise them.